Hey there, working listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. Debit card users, listen up. You've worked hard for your money. Now it's time to make it work even harder for you. With Discover Cashback Debit, everyone can get cash back on everyday debit card purchases. That's right. Earn on things like gas, groceries, and even that midday latte. And to top it off, there are no fees, period. Yep, that means you won't be charged fees on your checking account. This one is a no-brainer. Transaction eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashback debit. Discover Bank. Member FDIC. As I've created more and more crosswords, I'm often left to wonder sort of why people are uh, remain interested in solving crossword puzzles. <laughs> For some... They just want to solve it as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. But I basically think people write and solve crossword puzzles to waste time, not to beat it. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, Ronald Young Jr. And I'm your other host, June Thomas. June Thomas! We are together yet again. Yet again. Tell me, who was that voice we just heard at the top of the episode? That was Anna Sheckman, who is a crossword compiler of some renown crossword compiler. I don't think I've ever heard that title before. What made you want to talk to Anna Schechtman right now? Well, Anna has a book coming out on March 5th. It's called The Riddles of the Sphinx. And it's about a whole bunch of things, including the now mostly forgotten feminist history of the crossword puzzle, especially in America. Mm. It's also about Anna's experience compiling crosswords while in high school and mm. working as New York Times puzzle master Will Shorts's assistant right out of college as well as her attempts to, I don't know exactly if solve is the right word, but figure out a personal mystery, which is her experience with anorexia. So there's a lot going on in the book, but it's wonderful, it's fascinating, and I really wanted to chat with her about it. That is incredible. It sounds like this book has it all. <laughs> yes. But I'll bet this interview doesn't quite have it all. I bet there's a little more for our <laughs> Slate Plus members. Uh, what can our Slate Plus members expect to hear? You are absolutely right. I did save something just for them. In that segment, Anna gets down to details about uh, the fees that crossword compilers make for their puzzles at various publications, which is extra interesting these days now that it's become clear that puzzles are one of the few things people are willing to pay money for. I should say I also asked her how it felt to write about her history with anorexia, which, I don't know, she really grappled with it. And I, I just wondered how that felt. If you're a Slate Plus member, make sure you stick around for that conversation at the end of the show. If you're not a Slate Plus member, you could sign up today at slate.com slash working plus. You'll get ad-free podcasts and bonus content like the segment June just described. You'll also get full access to all of the articles on slate.com. Also, if you become a Slate Plus member, you'll be supporting our work and the work of everyone at Slate. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. All right, let's listen to June's conversation with Anna Schechtman. Debit card users, listen up. You've worked hard for your money. Now it's time to make it work even harder for you. With Discover Cashback Debit, everyone can get cash back on everyday debit card purchases. That's right. Earn on things like gas, groceries, and even that midday latte. And to top it off, there are no fees, period. Yep, that means you won't be charged fees on your checking account. This one is a no-brainer. Transaction eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashback debit. Discover Bank. Member FDIC. 
Anna Schekman, welcome to Working. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. So today we'll mostly be talking about the creative work of constructing crosswords, but the occasion for our conversation is the March 5th publication of your book, The Riddles of the Sphinx, Inheriting the Feminist History of the Crossword Puzzle, which is full of fascinating information about women's essential role in the popularization of the crossword puzzle, your own history of anorexia, and much more. It's a beautifully written, complex book. So before we talk about one aspect of it, I wanted to let listeners know that there is a lot more to the book, but we're mostly going to talk about crosswords. So you started constructing crosswords very young. How did you get into it? So I'm actually part of this small micro generation of crossword constructors We all got our start after seeing the documentary Wordplay, which featured crossword constructors and crossword solvers, speed solvers actually, at the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. And the A plot of the film was the the tournament, the, the solvers, the speed solvers, who are exceptionally smart and kind of perverse can solve a puzzle in, a, <laughs> in under two or three minutes. Wow. The B plot is celebrity crossword fans. <laughs> and then the C plot is apparently what captured all of our interests and attention, which was the actual construction of a crossword puzzle by prolific, joyful constructor Merle Regal. And he sits down in his living room and he has a piece of graph paper and a pencil and periodically goes and checks his dictionary. But for the most part, (laughs) for the most part, he just sits there and he gets words to intersect. Red top a word. Red top. It's not. No, well then now it just just falls into place. This could be jurists or purists. Put a J in there. Um, But this is going to be clay and not clan. I was just enchanted, and it seemed to me like he had this miraculous power over the English language (laughs) and could sort of unearth new words from existing words, could rearrange letters in some sort of quasi-mathematical way. And Mm -hmm. I just wanted to emulate what he was doing. And so I did. I went home and for the next few years... I sometimes say I created crossword puzzles for no one because I wasn't thinking, <laughs> I wasn't thinking, oh, I'll, I'll publish in the Times, I'll attend that tournament, I'll be a speed solver. There was, there, you know, I, I actually was a pretty competitive child, but not in the <laughs> world of crossword puzzles. I just wanted to reproduce that magical moment on screen. It's funny because, as you mentioned, Merle Regal composed his puzzles with graph paper with dictionaries. And that's how you started, as you said. But that's not how most puzzles are made these days, right? I mean, how's it done now? That's right. Yeah. At the time when I started you know, emulating Merle, I was really one of a very small handful of constructors who use graph paper and pencil, which, you know, I was in high school, so I had plenty of graph paper around. <laughs> <laughs> um, but most people were using these uh, software programs like Crossword Compiler and Crossfire, which I should say I certainly now use. Um, Mm. You know, I now write puzzles for The New Yorker and I write what are called themeless puzzles. And if you'd like, we can get into that. But those are so difficult to create by hand. And whenever I tried, when I was still using graph paper and and pencil, they were just terrible. They were very bad puzzles. (laughs) But the software programs not only make... Just significantly better puzzles, they completely transform the project of writing them. Just in brief, instead of really focusing on how to get words to intersect on the page, that work is predominantly offloaded onto the, the program's algorithm, where, in which you actually press a, a button called autofill and uh, <laughs> words populate the grid that you've designed. Um, there's still a tremendous amount of work for the constructor. It's mostly, yeah. though, in curating what's called a word list. And that means trying to basically instruct the algorithm what are good words and what are bad words. It's a really fascinating 
project in a sort of like cultural studies way. How do you, what is a right, good word exactly. of the moment? Um, and what's strange about that is, well, it's just really not the project I signed up for at, at the time, you know? <laughs> um, I, I think I really had this fantasy that I was kind of living in language, which is to say words really didn't have very much meaning. They were like strings of letters. And now when yeah, you're yeah. curating your word list, it's, it's really all about meaning. It's just about how words signify in your daily life. Um, so living in a word list versus living in a string of letters is a very different experience. Well, it's funny because as I read in the Riddles of the Sphinx about the word list and the autofill, I wasn't quite persuaded. I mean, I'm sure it makes it easier because, yes, more words are available than you can just immediately pull up in your head. But there's still just a very high degree of difficulty because you still have to write the clues right. Isn't isn't that the hardest part? Oh, well, yes and yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to qualify it, but no, writing, writing clues is just really, really very difficult. But presuming that you've completed this immaculate, elegant grid of interlocking words, you then have to step back and write clues depending on the difficulty of the puzzle. And you might think that if it's a harder puzzle, which in the New York Times is a sort of later in the week puzzle, mm -hmm. that those would be the hardest clues to write because you're really trying to stump the solver using oftentimes kind of misdirection mm -hmm. so that the first word that comes to mind for the solver is is you know, the inverse or opposite of what, what the answer actually is. Mm -hmm. But I actually think writing easy clues is, is very hard as well. Sometimes it can be just sort of strictly definitional, and I rely very heavily on a thesaurus. But you still want it to be of interest and also not totally yeah. repetitive, as loyal solvers will know. There are a lot of words that show up all the time in crossword puzzles. Right, right. So how to clue those words without totally boring your solver and yet also allowing them to complete the puzzle, get their foothold in so they have yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they have that word, but um, but still create and sustain interest. Yeah, so as you're talking, I'm remembering that in the book, you talk about a word I'd never heard of before. I didn't even recognize it as a word, which is natick. Now, that has a particular meaning when it comes to the cross world, as you might call right. it, the world of, of crosswords. What does that mean? How did it come about? Why is it a problem? Right. So if anyone knows the word, they might know it as a town outside of Boston. And uh, that is how it was clued once in a crossword puzzle. Although I think it was an even sort of more obscure clue than that. It was something like on, on some spot on the Boston Marathon, right? Oh, wow. It's not okay. going to be very meaningful to most people um, and not most crossword solvers. It intersected with another somewhat obscure clue or somewhat obscure answer. And from there, the crossword blogger, who his crossword alias is Rex Parker, his real name is Michael Sharp, he defined the term natick as an unfair crossing. Something that would, if, you know, if both answers are obscure, you're going to be left with that open square and to which you're only going to be able to guess what's that what's mm -hmm. that letter is it matic is it zadic right turns out <laughs> it's it's natic right but you would need that crossing to help you achieve to, to help you fill in the grid um so yeah whether that's something that crossword constructors really need to be attuned to is is not just what the words are that are in your grid but where they are right because i guess you're both trying to challenge the regular solvers, but it also there's also this sense that things must be fair, right? Right. Yeah. It's as I've you know created more and more crosswords, I'm often left to wonder sort of why I do this and why people <laughs> why people are uh, remain interested in in solving crossword puzzles, um, and it's I think it varies. I think for some there is a real desire to see new words and to um, learn interesting facts, trivia. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. for others, there's they just want to solve it as quickly as possible, and they even maybe race themselves, try to beat their previous scores. Mm -hmm. But but also, I, I basically think that people write and solve crossword puzzles to waste time, not 
to beat it. <laughs> That's, mm-hmm. um, but if you're creating a puzzle, you sort of have to know that there are going to be solvers who are really focused on beating time, not wasting it. And so this issue of fairness, right? You, you don't want to squander their, their times and their scores because of an unfair crossing. Right. Well, in the book, you said something, and you mentioned it earlier, that, that surprised me. And that is that it's easier to construct themed puzzles. Uh, and in the New York Times, which is, you know, probably the biggest crossword in the US, right? Not only does the crossword get harder as the days go on, but the the theming becomes looser. So I guess, first of all, am I right? But secondly, why is it that themeless puzzles are harder? So all of this is based around conventions that the New York Times established. The founding crossword editor of the Times, this woman named Margaret Fair, took it upon herself to really conventionalize and promote a certain kind of crossword puzzle and crossword puzzle solving. That meant that she instituted this rule that the puzzle gets harder over the course of the week. And eventually that the, I don't think it was actually her at this point, that the Friday and Saturday puzzles don't have themes, which means when you're sitting down to create one of these themeless puzzles, your only question is, what are words I'd like to see in the grid? Not what is a what are some ways to connect the main words in the puzzle in a, in a way that will delight the solver right um, <laughs> so it's a really peculiar project like what's a good word what what is right. um, or what is a word I have a especially good clue for we call those entries our seed entries um, mm. and those are harder to construct and harder to solve for, for really the same reason, which is that there are significantly fewer black squares. Oh. What that means is that the words are all much longer. And so there's fewer opportunities, both for a constructor and solver, to kind of get a toehold. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're crossing two 10-letter words or 10-letter phrases, there's, there's just not as many of those small crossings that will allow you to solve the puzzle or see almost Wheel of Fortune style, you know, yes. <laughs> what, right. what, the, what the letters are in your crossings. Um, also, again, the project is just different because what those good answers are, those really gratifying answers, couldn't be more arbitrary. The, 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 the themes constrain you a little bit, mm-hmm. but you have some sense of purpose or direction. I'm trying to get this right. theme. I'm trying to, yeah, yeah. to figure out the sort of trick or gimmick of the puzzle as opposed to just like, well, that's an interesting phrase, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. We'll be right back with more of June's conversation with Anna Schechtman. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. 
Apple Card is the perfect cashback rewards credit card. Earn up to 3% daily cashback on every purchase every day. Then grow it at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account with Apple Card. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. Terms apply. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we wrestle with creative challenges and try to provide our best solutions. So what are your creative challenges? Let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, back to June's conversation with Anna Schechtman. Okay, so now I understand why themeless crosswords are harder. But how do you figure out difficulty? How do you make it so that Thursday is harder than Monday? I mean, how do you know what people won't get? (sighs) Well, I mean, there's a sort of simple answer to that question, which has to do with conventions and norms. And then there's a much harder answer to that question, which (laughs) is, um, you know, who do you imagine your solver to be? Mm -hmm. So the conventions and norms would tell you that your solver is someone who's been solving a number of puzzles, mostly a number of times crossword puzzles, and therefore you have some expectation that they will expect a Monday theme to have this type of uh, trick or gimmick. Uh-huh. But if, you're, if you step away from that for a second, questions about difficulty become, I think, much more interesting and much more complicated um, because you have to project a sort of real understanding of common knowledge. And that's, a, that's really a tricky thing to, to, to grasp. What is common knowledge? What should I expect to be sort of canonical or knowable by whom, yeah. right? Who's my audience? Right. Um, and right. so... And I'm guessing that the people you hear from yeah. are a specific subset. Maybe the competitive solvers, maybe the the timed solvers, so that that's right. Like to what extent you even even never mind those senses of expected knowledge and knowledge base, but you also, if you are actually hearing from folks, you're hearing from a specific subset for the most part, right? Yes, you almost. Always, I mean, sometimes I'm lucky and I'll get feedback from someone who just really liked something I did on a puzzle, but. <laughs> and, uh, Probably uh, expectedly, most often I hear from people who really didn't like something I put in a puzzle. And maybe that's because it presented a natick for them, right? But even that yeah. is not a neutral term because what if I, I mean, I'll, I can give you an example. I constructed a puzzle for the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament that, that competition featured in Wordplay back in 2015. And I had a crossing the down was uh, one of the girls from Girls, <laughs> and the across. And I should say this was, you know, Girls Speak was omnipresent mm-hmm, at this right. time. I, mm-hmm. I assumed that would be gettable, um, maybe a little tricky, but gettable. And the across was backpack brand. Again, I don't. I'm not. There's not. There's no tricky word play here. These are pretty definitional, mm-hmm. but it meant that. The J from Jessa in one of the girls from Girls and the J from Jansport in Backpack Brand crossed. And that totally sunk certain solvers' rankings in the, in the tournament. And I have to tell you, Anna, those would be the easiest... For me, too. Yeah. <laughs> Clues for me. Yeah. Well, I, I, and I, I can only really do Monday and Tuesday. I'm stuck after that. But those, I could do those. Right. But that right? was considered a natick by certain solvers because they didn't watch girls and, you know, absolutely no sin, right. no sin there. Um, but they also had not, didn't know Jansport as a backpack brand. And, you know, that just led me to wonder what kind of person doesn't know both girls <laughs> and doesn't know backpack brand. And I couldn't help but sort of spin out this image of the, of the crossword solvers that, of course, were the ones grumbling and griping. Um, (laughs) 
which was basically a man. <laughs> I don't know how to put it more put it more delicately than that. Put it that way. Um, yeah, and so I will say it is. I can just say actually from the perspective of a solver, I'm always really, I have started over time scrutinizing bylines to know which puzzles I will be able to do particularly well in and which I'll I'll have Mm. a really hard time with. And usually it's people around my age, often it's women or queer people um, who will make puzzles where I have a sense of our shared common knowledge. Right. Because after all, the notion of a sort of a political abstract common knowledge is a is a fantasy. Yeah. It's a nice one, but it's yeah, a fantasy. Right, right. And and there's this existential question almost about whether the purpose of a crossword is to expand your knowledge, to you know, explore words and to have fun with them, or that this is a thing that I've been doing for the last X years and I know how to do it and I don't really want to be disrupted and learn new words. I just want to keep doing my my puzzles, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, I wonder, it, it is not really necessarily anything wrong with either point of view, but they're not the same. Yeah, that's right. And I wonder if it's because it's a daily ritual yeah. that, right, right. first of all, people get <laughs> are so attached to it that it really does upset them when they can't solve it or that they, yeah. you know, some, some wrench has been thrown into their system. But also because there's a certain reliability to it because it's daily. Yeah, yeah. And if it's not reliable, like what... What a threat. <laughs> um, yeah, right. But um, something that I have wondered about is that a, a criticism that I often get is that my puzzles are too filled with trivia. And I've, I always find that interesting because I think what most people mean when they say that to me is that I've included proper nouns or words from sort of communities or subcultures that I identify with, whether that's like from film Twitter or uh, academic publishing or, um, you know, the history of hip hop, Uh, you know, whatever it is, that they're they're proper nouns or even not necessarily proper nouns. I think I put like neoliberalism in a puzzle and that really pissed some people (laughs) off. (laughs) Um, That... These are seen as trivia be- precisely because they're seen as trivial to this particular audience, right. um, not because right. there's anything formal about the words that like their proper nounness that would that would distinguish them as as more or less trivia than other crossword yeah. film. So yes, a, a, a yeah. very a way to trivialize something that really is already trivial. It's 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 a puzzle. It's for it's just, fun. I know yeah. this is why you want to yeah. you want to like be like it's not that deep, man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh no, I'm it not, is. I'm, it I'm, is. Silly, I'm yeah. not ready to go yeah. down that, down that <laughs> line. Uh, so let's talk about your history, not only as a puzzle constructor, but specifically at the New York Times. You were the second youngest woman to have a crossword published in the New York Times. How old were you then? I was 19 then. Okay. And then shortly after graduation from college, Will Shorts, the longtime puzzle master of the New York Times, he hired you as his assistant. And you write that you felt you were hired because of your gender. Over Shorts' 30-year tenure at the Times, 80% of the paper's puzzles had been created by men, and the numbers of women constructors had actually fallen over time. Now, I'm curious, first of all, what explanations were offered for that decline. But I also, like, on a, again, on a, a larger scale, why does that matter? Right. Great questions. And I should say, I, I think I was unfairly defensive about this very lovely invitation, right, to be his assistant. And, but I sat there saying, no, that I must be a diversity hire. I'm not qualified or I'm only qualified for this thing that actually has nothing to do with me or my puzzles. I actually think it has quite a bit to do with me and my puzzles. And it was really right, um, right. kind of terrific for him to invite me to help him with the puzzle every day, um, especially yeah. since there were so many more specifically men, men my age who had also seen this documentary, been inspired to write puzzles as, yeah. a, as a result. And I thought, why isn't he asking them? And I think he wasn't because so much of our daily work, I mean, who knows why exactly he asked me, but right. uh, so much of our daily work made us, forced us to encounter the fact of our, of our difference, our gender difference, but also our generational difference, 
um, regional difference. He grew up in Indiana. I grew up in lower Manhattan <laughs> because we had to, um, most of our work is rewriting the clues of a puzzle. He writes up to 95% yeah. of the clues in a, in a puzzle submission that he accepts. And so we would sit in his home office just kind of free associating together. <laughs> um, really, really big. It sounds like a pretty good job, it, I have it to was, say. Like, it was yeah. pretty fantastic. Um, but also at times really frustrating because we would constantly be bumping up against this question of, puzzle worthiness of what's common knowledge of what's fair sort of fair use in the realm of crossword puzzles Mm, yeah so you know we're sitting there spinning out you know what's a what's a good clue for the word bro say um which is very frequently in a crossword puzzle one of those small small words that therefore is very useful for constructors and you know it's usually clued as sister's sib or relative (laughs) of sis And I was like, well, what about the phenomenon of bros? You know, I just graduated from college. I know all about, (laughs) I know all about bros. Um, And so I kind of dutifully explained to him, I think I might've, you know, there was some YouTube clips involved, um, (laughs) of what this phenomenon is that we landed on cluing as uh, something like party-loving, egotistical young man in slang, something like that. Um, but that was... Luckily in brief. Yeah, exactly. Um, longer than most crossword clues, though. Um, and, you know, that was a function of our expanding each other's set of common knowledge. We'll say I've learned a tremendous amount about sort of like old cars and old <laughs> cartoons from, from Will as well. And I, I think he's been tremendously receptive to introducing uh, neologisms and slang and popular culture into the crossword grid. I mean, if you look at puzzles before his time, it's sort of shocking how narrow and, and by comparison the kinds of words and phrases you encounter in a grid mm-hmm. are. That doesn't mean, though, that he still doesn't kind of sometimes get his back up and say, well, that's not a that's not a thing, right? And it's funny how this, like, right. notion of what a thing is or one's thingliness yeah. became our shorthand. But how to prove to, to him that something is, or to any crossword puzzle editor, right, that something right. is worthy of inclusion in this kind of pantheon of <laughs> relevance, right, or of something that is worth being recognized as a thing in the culture. That notion of puzzle-worthy is really interesting. When you and Will were having those discussions about what was acceptable, what were the methods that you kind of tried to find some objective answer? How would you decide if something was worthy of the puzzle? Yeah, it's a good question. I, and, you know, at some level, these are subjective judgment calls. But I would marshal resources, right? Google hits. <laughs> um, actually, how many times something appeared in the pages of the New York Times. Very grateful to the, oh. you know, NewYorkTimes.com, which allows you to just do a quick search. Um, and sometimes that that works, right? I think at some level, Shorts is imagining that his solvers are New York Times readers, and so that's helpful. Mm, mm. But I, I also know that is not ultimately going to convince him if he doesn't want to be convinced. And he has test solvers and an editorial team who weigh in on these things now, too. And through certain forms of advocacy, those teams have also become more um, diversified by race and gender and ethnicity um, and sexual orientation. And so it is, I think, probably more of a collective decision now than it than it used to be. But I still have, you know, innumerable examples of people telling me, you know, he didn't want to put uh, SNCC in a puzzle or he didn't want to put uh, matcha tea in a puzzle. And these things, as I, I have this list, right, of, of terms that I've collected and that I, I know my peers have collected, sort of our our access to grind at this point. And so many of those terms have now, (laughs) have now, you know, entered into the puzzles, you know, years later. um, Yeah. Because it is about the evolution of language and the evolution of something that is, you know, mainstream language, if there is such a thing. I know we've put a lot of pressure on that idea already. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, one of the stories from your book that I found really moving was the story of Portia Lundy, uh, the second black woman to publish a crossword in the New York Times. She didn't grow up in a crossword-solving household, 
But after her first New York Times puzzle came out, she learned that her father had actually been really involved in the cross world, you might say, in his native Guyana. But when he emigrated to the US, he gave them up because the American crosswords were based on a different set of knowledge. And, you know, I have to say, I can relate. Coming back to the UK after 40 years in the States, I find what are supposed to be easy crosswords hard because I think not because of things like different spelling rules, but because they rely on celebrities that I think of as minor celebrities because I don't know them or sports stars. In other words, every single crossword is embracing or rejecting someone, whether or not they're aware of it. Right. So what do you do? How do you make things fairer? Well, it's, there's a um, a number of things, I think, to say to that. The first is, you're right, I was also extremely moved, I mean, kind of exhilarated by Portia's story because she not only found out that her father was a crossword solver in his youth, but that I think his brother had, like, founded the first crossword tournament in Guyana. I mean, it was, like, really essential to their family lore that she actually didn't know about until she came home and said, I'm publishing a puzzle in the New York Times, um, in which this whole backstory comes out. Um, but for her, when she was constructing her puzzle, she told me that it was really important to her that the very first entry, and it was J-A-D-A, Jada, clue to Jada Pinkett Smith. She's like, it was important Mm. to me that that very first entry was something that would be gettable by my family members. Um, Mm. Because upon running through the very first few entries in a crossword puzzle and not being able to solve any of them, she imagined that there are certain people who are going to walk away from that and think, I'm just not very smart. Yeah. And feel kind of dejected. um, Or that this is somehow like a racially and... uh, you know, unmarked test of intelligence, mm-hmm. which of course it's mm-hmm. not, as uh, you know, as, as as you've just explained as well. It's like every form of knowledge; it is conditioned and um, constructed based on all sorts of um, social factors. And so, you know, one solution to this, which, or way to be as inclusive as possible, without also then p- people sort of turning away because. Of course, you can't account for every subject position and every clue. Um, is to have more narrowly defined crossword puzzle outlets. So, in the last, like, mm. I think probably ten to fifteen years, we see the rise of queer crosswords. We have uh, the incubator. I should somehow relay to you the puns that are embedded in these phrases. Right? <laughs> it's queer crosswords is also with a Q. <laughs> incubator is spelled I N K U. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, incubator is a sort of for women by women crossword puzzle project that is a subscription service. As many of these are um, black crosswords. These are sort of how to how to describe them. They're well, they rest on a couple of assumptions. I'll say um, one is that your subject position will actually just inform what you know and how you know it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's also this interesting responsibility that's been taken on by the editors. I, I know the women who started Incubator, um, and I've, I've spoken to them, and they've, you know, they assume, and I think often really correctly, that if you're a woman writing a crossword puzzle, your puzzles are going to be filled with references about women. And that there might even be something like, a, not exactly a separatist idiom, but like, roughly speaking, women's language. Yeah. But then they also concede that part of their work of editing, I think one of them said, we're always women, womening up clues, you know, um, which is to right. say, you know, finding references to maybe famous women or, um, you know, historical artifacts of women's culture that they're then putting into the clues. Um, I think one of them mm-hmm. told me, and if someone then learns who Bella Abzug is by coincidence, <laughs> then, you know, or, the, you know, as a consequence, all the better. Um, so I mean, yeah. Bella Abzug, what a great crossword name, right? right? I, mean, I know. Five, five, lots of vowels. So much to thank her for on so many different fronts. <laughs> <laughs> Anna Shekman, thank you so much for joining us on Working to Talk about the creative process of constructing crosswords. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Coming up next, we'll talk more about crossword puzzles and natics and whether or not this type of gaming could bridge the cultural divide in our society. So stick around for that. That's a small ask, isn't it? (laughs) This new year, it's time to do wellness on your terms. That's where Ollie comes in. Thanks to their delightful gummies, you can actually get a good night's sleep. 
and you might finally stand a chance of staying focused. Because this is the year of you. Discover all your vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Shipping can make or break a sale, so optimize how you ship your orders with ShipStation. They make it easy to automate and manage orders no matter how big your business grows. And they might even be able to help reduce shipping and warehouse costs. So optimize and keep up your momentum for growth with ShipStation. Sign up for your free 60-day trial now at ShipStation.com and use the code P-O-D. That's ShipStation.com with the code P-O-D. June, I am a huge fan of crossword puzzles. Mm. They were a big part of a relationship I was in. Uh, I actually wasn't into them as much before I met this woman. But we had this process where we would work on them separately. And then we'd come together and we'd compare notes. And the rules were that we could only be mean to each other during game time. So (laughs) (laughs) during that notes comparing time, there was a lot of very condescending comments about what the word could possibly be. It was a tense process, but it was also one of my favorite parts of that relationship because we had so much fun solving together. Mm. But I had no idea about the competitive world of speed speed solving. Mm-hmm. Like we were just doing a fun activity together. June, tell me more about your relationship with crossword puzzles. Are you into them? Do you have a routine? First, Ronald, that is one of the most romantic stories I've ever heard, even though that relationship <laughs> apparently didn't work out. <laughs> Couple solving isn't something that everyone can handle. Neither my partner nor I are particularly competitive, but working on the same puzzle is too much for us. So, you know, kudos there. <laughs> right now, I'm not in a crossword season of my life, but I do very much enjoy a puzzle. I'm now again into Wordle, and I've recently started doing Connections, which is a newish New York Times puzzle that is all about making links between words and sorting them into groups. They're both puzzles that you can do very quickly, which I like, because I use them as a sort of gateway between my early morning relaxation, you know, when I'm having my breakfast and reading the paper, to shifting gears and going to my computer at work. It's Mm. almost like a palate cleanser for the brain. And Mm -hmm. so I want them to be, you know, swift and refreshing rather than, you know, long lasting and engrossing. I also find connections very suited to my way of writing. I'm one of those people who's focused on spotting patterns and then trying to convince other people that there really is something in them rather than just random coincidence. And so connections gets me into the right frame of mind for that kind of connecting the dots. So really recommend Connections. I love that. I will give it a try. I I love the idea of the transition of puzzle time into work time because I think it is a good way to kind of get your brain started. It's like a good warm up, like a stretch for the brain before you actually kind of get into uh, some serious work. So I love that. It's also striking to me the amount of intention that goes into creating a crossword (laughs) puzzle, which is probably a bit obvious when I think about what it takes to solve one. (laughs) I loved when she started talking about a natick or an unfair crossing. I always thought puzzle makers would pride themselves on the lack of solvability of a puzzle, kind of celebrating that as a win. But the joining together the makers and the solvers does kind of mean that there should be some sort of rules. We should agree to something. So what do you think about this type of intention when it comes to making crossword puzzles? Oh, it's fascinating, right? And I do think it's an example of something that we all confront in whatever kind of creative work we do, which is assuming a knowledge base and a shared vocabulary. Um, In the world of crosswords, a certain subset of people, as you say, are speed solvers, or they're really focused on their solving streak. So they're hyper attuned to questions of fairness. You know, will my streak be broken or my speed solving average tanked by answers that I think are too niche? But (laughs) that whole issue is not at all neutral. You know, for example, in, in trivia contests and sometimes in crosswords, it's considered totally fair to use French words because French, I guess, is a language that is taught in a certain kind of school and university. Ugh. And knowing it what is or was at least considered the language of intellectuals. But, you know, why? There are a lot more people in the world who speak Hindi or Mandarin or, or to a lesser extent, Swahili. But words from those languages rarely make it into the clues. And it's the same when you're writing and definitely when editing. What kind of vocabulary can you count on your readers knowing? Mm -hmm. Or will they recognize references to? 
Ronald, on an episode of Solvable, another podcast you hosted, I learned that your father's a pastor and you grew up in the church. Yes. (laughs) And, you know, that's not my experience, but it is by no means an unknown world. That should definitely be part of the shared knowledge base, as should other non-Christian faiths. It's all about whose experience gets to be accepted at something that everyone should understand and recognize and whose is felt to require extra hand-holding, what the NPR mm-hmm. show Code Switch called the explanatory comma. So that's always something to think about and definitely in crosswords. It's funny because you're, you're talking about the thing, you know what I mean? The mm-hmm. thing to say like, whose culture gets to mm-hmm. be considered kind of the center when yeah. it comes to, to puzzling, which is something that really I didn't even think about. I thought I was just solving a crossword, but it never <laughs> occurred to me that the maker would actually matter. And yeah. when Anna started talking about searching the bylines and knowing which puzzles she would do particularly well on, I felt like I had an epiphany again about the idea of a natic, knowing that one person's natic is not universal at all, yeah. which again pulls us away from the idea that makers are trying to stump solvers. But man, the idea of how race, gender, sexuality would be informing the makers was, again, another obvious thought that just did not occur to me. Let's revisit that idea you mentioned about crossword puzzles expanding our knowledge. Do you think that crossword puzzles could be something that could intentionally bring cultures and subsets of the population together? It was definitely interesting to me to learn from Anna that the way the cross world, you know, this this community of crossword people have tackled this is by going more niche, you know, mm-hmm. having puzzles made by and for women, by and for queer people, by and for people of color, because that way you can expand the shared knowledge base without having people freaking out about their streak or their solving time or things they think are unworthy of knowing. Mm-hmm. And Not to sound too kumbaya, but I hope that doesn't lead us to kind of going backward when it comes to expanding what mainstream puzzles deem puzzle worthy, because that feels like a really good trend and something that is really good for, you know, expanding what people think is worthy. And if it takes puzzles for people to make a bit more of an effort to expand their definition of what's important and what matters in culture and life, then, you know, bring it on. Yeah. Having worked with several Ivy Leaguers, um, you know, not to pick, but I've noticed that they tend to have certain interests that might have helped them get into those elite schools or have prospered there socially. But things that are actually more relevant in the larger world, but don't count at Princeton. Nah, you know, even, mm. even if it's basic stuff like learning a foreign language, that that's not going to help you get in, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. if crosswords can cause people to be more curious about more things, well, let's go. I like that. I I really do. I I just I like the idea of being able to do a little puzzle because, you know, I did that with Wordle. Sometimes I would get a word on Wordle where I'm like, I don't know what this is. I just guessed it. And now (laughs) I have to look up the definition and say, wow, this is a word. Um, And I think the idea of being able to be a little bit more curious, expand my knowledge Mm -hmm. a little bit through gamifying it is just like, I don't know, that's very exciting to me. I have to say, though, when playing Wordle, I'm always mad when a word that I was sure was a word is not a word because, come on! That, yeah, like, yeah. It's okay when, when, I, when <laughs> yeah. okay, that's a real word and I don't know it, but when I, I know this word. Oh, wait, it doesn't exist? Oh, okay. <laughs> June, tell me, if you could do any puzzle or leisure-related job, i.e. puzzle maker, board game maker, outdoor activity game maker, huh. whatever you could choose to make, What would you be best at? What would you like to make for us to play or solve? Well, my first thought was something to teach people about queer culture, but they can just buy my book, A Place of Our Own, (laughs) Six Spaces That Shape Queer Women's Culture. That's a plug. That's a definite (laughs) plug. It's out on May 28th, by the way. But as someone who grew up speaking a dialect and now lives in a place where there is a sort of parallel language that's used alongside English, which... I live in Edinburgh, so that's Mm. the Scots words that appear in English sentences. I would maybe try to come up with something that would help people expand their vocabulary, Mm -hmm. which really means expanding, again, expanding their knowledge, understanding of people. My game would help people learn words from Lancashire dialect or Scots or terms that are important in a Sikh Gurdwara. Uh, But it would also be massive fun. And we should not forget that it is supposed to be fun. 
All right, that's all the time we have for today's show. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you join Slate Plus, you'll get to hear all of our episodes ad-free. You'll also get to hear exclusive segments on our show and a lot of other Slate podcasts, and you'll get full access to all the articles on Slate.com. You can sign up today at Slate.com slash Working Plus. Thank you to Anna Sheckman for being our guest this week. And thanks to our producer, Cameron Drews, who gets to puzzle out how to make idiots like me sound smart. We'll be back next week with Isaac's conversation with acting coach Howard Fine. Until then, get back to work. <laughs> 